Hey, what's happening, everybody? My name is Chris Cusimano. I'm the team lead of the Home Spy Cousy team here in Southeast Florida, and we are in February of 2022, and it was time to give our first market update video of the year. What's happening now? What's going to happen in the near future going forward? Should you buy? Should you sell? Should you wait? Should you hold? What should you do? Well, I'm hoping that this video will address these questions with some real-world data and real-world information. Now, I always say that this is my little disclaimer that I could be wrong. All, all this data has been accumulated from other sources, from people much smarter than me. And I put it together in these easy to follow videos for you to try to address some of these concerns and questions. But again, they could be wrong. They've been wrong before. I could be wrong. This is just based on the best information that we have going at this current time. All right, so my last update, which I did in November of 2021, we covered the differences between the 2007, 8, and 9 recession and compared them to today and basically came up with the conclusion that they're not alike at all, and most likely prices are going to still increase, just not as fast as before. Well, since then, that has been happening. Granted, it's only been three months, but that has been happening to date. And since then, there has been a number of new things that have landed on people's plates and people asking me that I should address them in the next video in regards of a pending recession or a market crash or a bubble. Now, these include the possible pending recession due to what's called the yield curve flattening or inverting. I know that's mouthy. We'll dive into that in a few minutes. The supply and demand situation, what's going on with new home construction would take a deeper dive because new home construction construction has ramped up, which is adding more supply. Interest rates. Interest rates are increasing. The first one scheduled to be next month in March of 2022. And all the experts are predicting that's going to happen uh, a number of times this year. And how is that going to affect the housing market? Lastly, we're going to dive into the hot topic of the day, which is inflation. And if you stick around to the very end, I'm going to briefly discuss one very important yet hardly spoken about situation that occurred in the Great Recession that's just not in play today. It's not a really a sexy subject, so it doesn't get a lot of coverage. So we're going to talk about it briefly and then move on. But it's very important of what happened then and why it doesn't apply to today. All right. The first item on our agenda to talk about today is the yield curve. And you're probably like wondering the yield what? Well, the yield curve is a curve that compares short-term investments versus long-term investments. Let me explain a little further. Basically, the government tries to offer bonds to investors, or they do offer bonds to investors on both a short-term basis and a long-term basis. And long-term bonds are riskier because their money is in a longer-term investment than the government. So the government likes to reward investors with a higher yield or a higher rate of return the longer they invest in the government through these bonds. And, and consequently, the shorter-term bonds have a lower yield or a lower rate of, of return. So investors, if they have a very strong feeling about the long-term outlook of the economy, they would have no problem investing in the longer term product because it's going to make them more, more money. However, if investors lo are losing confidence in the economy as a whole, they might not invest at all in any bonds or they'll opt in for shorter ones because it's less risky. So when they do that, the curve, the yield curve no longer slopes up. It either flattens or it slopes down. And you're probably wondering, okay, so what? Well, the so what is that every time this has occurred, a recession has followed at least in recent times. So here's an example. If you look at this graph here from the 1980s through today, this compares a long-term 10-year bond rate minus a two-year bond. Um, and the shaded areas are recessions. And what you'll see that every time the graph dips below the zero line, a recession soon has followed. Okay, so that zero line re represents an inverted yield curve. And the last one was in 2019, and we all know what happened in 2020. And this is why people pay such close attention to the yield curve. It has been remarkably accurate in predicting recession year after year. And some people will put this or equate this to a pending recession means a collapse in the housing market or a bubble to burst. The thing is, they really don't understand what a recession is. So let me let me clarify it. Recession is simply a period of temporary economic decline during which trade and industrial activities are reduced. It's generally identified as the GDP and is reduced for two successive quarters. And even further, we don't even realize we're in a recession usually until we're almost out of it, unless it gets really, really bad. And here's the kicker out of it all. During all of the recent recessions, housing prices still climbed. You can check, it, check that out from the graph here, other than in 2009. And it was discussed in the last video, uh, we, did, we discussed that the housing crash had nothing to do 
with the yield curve or the recession. All right, next let's talk about supply and demand because as we know, supply versus demand or that relationship of that ratio hits at the very core of pricing of just about any type of economic transaction or product that's out there, including housing. So if you take a look at this graph here that covers from 1999 to about today-ish, give or take, you'll see that if you look before the Great Recession, the number of existing homes that were available and there were an abundance of them. So it wasn't uh, the lack of inventory that caused the crash. It was the other way around. There was too many houses available because if you look at today, all those prices are still high. Take a look at that. There's almost no properties available. And if you want to take a look at it in even a more visually appealing way, take a look at this graph courtesy of Keeping Current Matters. And let's just focus on the national average right there in the bottom. You'll see that the inventory of housing year over year is tw about 27% lower. Um, and let's look at Florida. Since this video is for mostly people even moving to Florida or people living in Florida because that's where I'm located, look at that. It's negative 48.1%. You say, okay, Chris, that's great. Supply is low, but how can you prove that demand is demand is high? Well, we can just take a look at two things. We can take a, take a look at mortgage applications. And just last week alone, we have an increase of 12% mortgage uh, applications a week over e a week, according to Mortgage Bankers Association. And then even further, let's look at the showings. Are homes being shown? If a home is being shown or a lot of houses are being shown, even with the light inventory, that means there's a lot of interest out there. In other words, there's a lot of demand. And we are crushing pre-pandemic numbers. Again, this graph is courtesy of Keeping Current Matters. Just look at it. Before the pandemic, we were a lot lower than now, all the way to the right. And those are our showings, the showing index, much, much higher in 2021. So again, supply is low. We have almost no homes available and we have a lot of demand. So next up, we're going to talk about the new construction boom because it is ramping up. Now, there were drastic increases in ho new homes that builders started to construct recently. Last year alone, 1.7 homes began the process of being built. But thing is, is that they're not exactly rolling off of the assembly line. So due to labor and material shortages, it's taken on average about six months to build one. So in addition to the long turnaround times, you also have a backlog of over a decade where new construction supply simply didn't keep up with the demand as populations grew. If you take a look at this chart right here, you will see that right before the Great Recession, new construction was at its highest peak since the early 70s. And then builders immediately ceased, for obvious reasons, producing more product or more homes. So from about 2005 to 2012, there were almost no new construction available or happening, but the population still grew. So it would be a long time before this new construction boom that's going on now and it's taken so long to build is going to catch up to the backlog of needed inventory due to the lack of building over the previous decade or so. So it shouldn't have any major impact on the overall housing market, at least in the near term. All right, next up on our list are interest rates. Yes, interest rates are going to increase, but how are they going to affect the market? Well, the short answer is not a whole lot. And before I get into why, just I just want to note that about 30 to 40% of the offers we are receiving on our listings at the Homes by Koozie team are cash. And I can probably just speculate that's going on across the board, not just with our team, that's a lot higher than normal. So the increase in, in rates aren't going to affect a big portion of the buyer pool currently. But what about the people who do obtain mortgages? How is it going to affect them and how is it going to affect the market? Well, let's just dive into it. And so if you take a look at this graph right here, these are the mortgage rate projections from comparing Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, MBA, which is the Mortgage Bankers Association, and NAR, which is the National Association of Realtors. And if you take the average of all four down here in the bottom right corner, you can see that they're predicting that the rates will still be under 4% by a long shot. It's only at 3.7. So in a real world application, if you took out a $500,000 mortgage at 3.3% today, your principal and interest payment will be about $2,190. Now, if you waited to the end of the year and it's at 3.7% on the same half million dollar loan, it's going to be at $2,301. It's only going to be a difference of $100 or so. It's not a whole lot that's going to sway you from stop buying a house. So it's not going to have a big impact on the housing market on a whole, at least not this year. And lastly, well, sort of lastly, but lastly, I want to talk about the new boogeyman and the new hot topic on everyone's lips, and that is inflation. Well, anyone who watches their news channel of choice or their uh, listen to a personality of their choice has a very strong opinion on inflation and how we got here and whose fault it is and if it's doom or if it's gloom or if it's going to be great. But the thing is, if you really ask those individuals to give you the definition of what inflation really is, you'll likely hear crickets. 
So I want to kind of explain briefly on what inflation is and how does how will it affect the housing market if it will at all. So let's talk about it. So inflation in the simplest forms is just an increase of prices of goods and services. Or in other words, you are spending or we are spending more money on more or less the same product or service than we were before. That doesn't sound all great, but let's talk about how we got here. I liked an article in Realtor.com by George Ray too. And I'm sorry, George, I'm saying your name wrong. It's R-A-T-I-U in Realtor.com. And he said, and he no- well, he noted that the U.S. government supplied American households with stimulus payments that gave us more purchasing power. The thing is, we didn't necessarily spend it on the things that we did prior to the pandemic, and that's what the government hoped that we'll do. And these are things like lunches and takeout food or going to gas stations, spending money in those convenience stores that are attached to them or dry cleaning or basically anything else that we normally spent money on prior to working uh, remotely more often. And because of this, these businesses that were normally, well, we were spending money on that we're not now, had to increase their prices to account for those losses or they risked of closing, they risk closing their shop and losing their income and businesses. And further compounding to the problem is manufacturing around the globe has faced many supply chain issues, mostly due to labor shortages that the pandemic has brought on. And then we had the bottleneck issues at our ports. And then I guess the icing of the cake would be the reduction of 16-wheel truckers that takes our goods from point A to point B. And all of these things have contributed to inflation. But the question here, the question we want to answer in the video today is, how does this affect the housing market? And if you're hoping that it brings prices down, well, I'm sorry to say, you probably need to buckle up because things aren't about to get more affordable. And the reason for that, if you go back to the first thing we spoke about, which was the inverted yield curve, you'll know that we discussed how investors who would typically invest in longer term bonds and stocks and other government instruments are now going to take their money out of those out of those investments and put in what they typically feel are safer investments like real estate. And this creates an even more competitive housing purchase environment, which again will drive prices up. And further, many of these investors purchase with cash. And most of us purchase with a mortgage. And mortgage rates run parallel to inflation rates, making your monthly payment more expensive, not only in terms of rates, but in terms of the house price in general. And the last piece of evidence on this is right here in this bar graph. And you can see if you look year by year since 1950 that the last two major inflation hikes prior to this year were 1974 and 1979. And then we can overlay or compare this graph to housing prices during that same time. And you see that the housing prices still rose. They didn't go down. All right, so one more quick side note before we get into the final predictions. And I wanted to point out a major difference that can get really complex and is why you don't hear about it all too often. And truthfully, I totally forgot about it also until I just recently read an article by Fisher Investments. So check out their article. What Fisher Investments noted was during the 2007 and 2009 recession, we had an accounting rule called FAS 157. So this can get a bit heavy. So I'm going to try to sum it up. Essentially, there was a rule that forced banks to value their assets that they intended to hold to maturity. And so these banks had to account for these as paper losses, and this forced them to raise capital. And then when interbank funding markets seized up, these institutions went under, although they were still solvents. And the government failed to rescue these institutions in any reasonable way, and this further exaggerated the problem. But since then, FAS 157 has been revised twice in 2011 again in 2018, which allows banks to account for these long-term investments in a different accounting bucket, giving them more room to breathe. Now, I know this can be a bit confusing, so check out their article in Fisher Investments. It's a really good read. You can find it on their website. All right, so let's wrap this up. The basic summary is this. A recession may occur, likely it likely will. And if so, it's likely due to a number of factors that we mentioned previously. But it won't negatively affect the housing market, nor do I or a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me expect any type of major market crash or any bubble to burst of any kind, anytime soon. As of what's going to happen in 2022 is, well, very similar to what I said was going to happen in the November 2021 video, is that the housing prices are going to still climb just at a less accelerated rate. And there again, there's no crash coming. And that's according to a half dozen research departments, again, of people who are smarter than I am. And this is a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, CoreLogic, Keeping Current Matters, Mortgage Bankers of America, and the National Association of Realtors. And again, this graph is courtesy of Keeping Current Matters. And you can see that they put all of these predictions into one graph for you. And on the left is the average of all of them saying that the house prices are going to increase by 5.2%. So we put this in some kind of tangible, a tangible bow, if you will and compare what you can expect to pay with the average predicted rate in price increases from 
today and compare them to December of 2022, this is what you can get. So let's say today you get an interest rate of 3.125% and you have a half million dollar loan amount. Your principal and interest payment will be $2,536. Now at 3.7%, and at 526000 which is the average predicted increases for rates and home prices, uh, respectively, your, your, your payment's going to be $2,833. So basically, if you wait to sell, you might make a little bit more money, but you might have a smaller buyer pool. And if you wait to buy, you'll not only pay more in price, but you'll pay more in principal and interest payments if you're getting a mortgage. So with that, I hope this answers the question in helps you to not sit on the fence if you're sitting on the fence and move forward on making your purchase because it's not the prices are not going to go down. And I really hope this was helpful for you sellers if you're wondering if, if there's a right time to sell or not. And the answer is, well, yes, it is. And you can still wait and you'll still be okay. And with that, it doesn't ever come down to time in the market. It's what's best for you and your family at the moment. Do you need a bigger house? Do you need a smaller house? Those are the things that are really more important because at the end of the day, it's your home. It's not just your investment. You know, your home is where your heart is. So with that, I, I hope this was helpful. And if you guys ever are in the need in the Southeast Florida region to buy or sell property and you need a good uh, real estate team to get you back, feel free to reach out to us. We'll love to help you because we're always friendly and we always answer the phone. I'll see you around.